Thank you, Dr. Glee. <clears throat> um, so it's a privilege to you know present the highlights uh, of all the leaders in urology. Um, I'm going to cover the areas in oncology, stones, pediatrics, and transplant. And I'm going to start with oncology because starting around with oncology actually has been shown to delay the time to laptop startup by about 14 minutes. So, <laughs> so for the residents, um, this is one of the leaders in prostate cancer research. Anyone know who this is? Fellows? <coughs> All right. So it's uh, Nick James. Uh, he's uh, chief investigator for the Stampede trial. Uh, this was published in the summer. And this was one of the trials to first look at abiraterone uh, for prostate cancer not previously treated uh, with hormone therapy. Uh, so a bit of background. There's some learners in the room. Abiraterone. Acetate is the pro-drug of abiraterone, and abiraterone itself inhibits endogenous uh, androgen biosynthesis by inhibiting CYP17A1. It's approved for CRPC in Canada, and it's given with prednisone, and this sh has showed a survival advantage. And its side effects are hypertension, hypokalemia, peripheral edemia, and uh, increased ASDALT. Its cost uh, is not insignificant at $3,000 per month. So what did uh, Stampede Trial do? <clears throat> it's um, a multi-group, multi-stage platform design uh, where they enroll or roll out new arms as the drugs or in science uh, advances. In this arm in particular, uh, abiraterone was given with prednisone and ADT. Uh, versus ADT alone, so current standard of care at the time. And they were randomized one to-one of, uh, one of men of any age uh, that would initiate long-term ADT for prostate cancer. Enrollment had to commence early uh, after receiving ADT. So it's early in the uh, castration process. And patients with clinically significant cardiovascular disease were excluded. So this is a key slide because uh, it goes over inclusion criteria for the trial. So if you think in the clinic who you'd ever start on ADT, well obviously newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, but they had other <clears throat> patients in the trial as well, so node positive prostate cancer. And these patients were also encouraged uh, to have local radiotherapy and high risk locally advanced prostate cancer, so at least two of uh, T3 or T4, uh, Gleason 8 to 10, or PSA over 40. And these patients were mandated to have local control and have radiation. And also it captured a few men uh, that relapsed that had previous uh, surgery or, or um, radiation therapy. So outcomes, uh, they looked at overall survival. And they also had an intermediate primary outcome. Because survival's um, prolonged in all of prostate cancer, uh, they had a failure-free survival to try to capture uh, those patients that had responded or not responded, but uh, had yet to sort of reach mortality. So they defined treatment failure as any radiologic, clinical, or PSA progression or death <coughs> specifically from prostate cancer. Other outcomes, symptomatic skeletal events, uh, which are very morbid and costly to the system, and adverse events. Um, so they enrolled 1,900 patients, 960 approximately in each arm. There's 111 UK sites, and interestingly, I didn't know this, but they had five Swiss sites as well. I thought it was just a UK trial. And they did this quite quickly, enrolling patients from 2011 through 2014. <laughs> Median age was 67 years, median PSA 53, and median follow-up was relatively short uh, for prostate cancer, 40 months. So this is a key slide, and you know, given that inclusion criteria, uh, how did all the patients stack up? <clears throat> 
So 52% were metastatic. Uh, that means, you know, 48% were not. So 20% were node positive and 28% were non-metastatic. So this is important later when you're um, sort of trying to interpret the results. And there's no difference in plan local control. About 40% of, of both uh, patient populations were planned to have uh, local radiotherapy. So looking at overall survival, uh, it was quite significant. Uh, there's a clear separation between the combination group, which had abiraterone, prednisone, and ADT versus ADT alone. And this is for all patients. So 48% were non-metastatic. Given that, the hazard ratio for death was still 0 0.63. So very significant. Um, because they median follow-up of four years, they did this three-year survival calculation. And this was also significant, 83% versus 76%. And much less deaths in the combination arm, all saying the same thing. And when you looked at those 52% of metastatic patients, uh, there was also a significant difference. In this trial, um, the median over overall survival for ADT alone was around three and a half years. And I saw an interview with Dr. Uh, Nick James, and he's projecting that the median over overall survival for the combination group will fall somewhere between six and a half and seven years. Uh, so they're very excited. And then that other co-primary endpoint, or intermediate endpoint, was the failure-free survival, uh, which shows quite a large difference between the combination and ADT alone. And this was clinical progression, PSA progression, radiological progression, or uh, death from prostate cancer. So significant advantage of having abiraterone, prednisone, ADT up front versus ADT alone, which is traditionally as of a couple years ago, standard care. So much less tra treatment failures um, in the combination group. And in all subgroups, the same thing. Uh, they were all quite significant, better in the uh, combination group versus ADT alone. This is a forest plot. And what I derive from this is that there's overall benefit, obvious, with the combination group. But if you're younger, um, under 70 years, and had metastatic disease, you had more to gain. And in the failure-free survival subgroup analysis, uh, they were all overwhelmingly favorable uh, for the combination group. What about symptomatic skeletal events? Um, these events are patients with a bone metastasis that either requires surgery, uh, that had neural cord compression, um, needed admission. So these can be quite morbid for patients. And the hazard ratio for symptomatic skeletal events was 0 0.46. Again, um, you know, quite superior versus ADT alone. And what about adverse events? Um, mostly it was just due to the known effects of abiraterone, hypertension, ALT, AST, and hypokalemia. But they're quite similar amongst the groups, uh, apart from those specific adverse events. And what about treatment after progression? Um, there's lots of options for patients. Um, in the CRPC uh, disease. And uh, obviously, if they're not progressing on abiraterone, less people in the uh, combination group would uh, need that medication. But uh, those people that were in the ADT alone group uh, did receive standard of care after they progressed while on, ab uh, while on ADT. And obviously, in the combination group, they received more docetaxel uh, versus the ADT alone group. 
So this just illustrates that approximately after three months of uh, progressing, 80% uh, of patients did receive uh, alternate or life prolonging therapy. And the same can be said for the combination group. So once they, were, once they progressed, uh, they were offered additional uh, therapy. So conclusions from this uh, trial is that men with locally advanced or metastatic prostate cancer who received ADT plus abiraterone and prednisolone had significantly higher rates of overall and failure-free survival than those with ADT alone. And then in addition, they said the combination therapy was associated with fewer symptomatic skeletal events, which down the road may play in, uh, to the cost effectiveness of, of this medication, even though it's very expensive. It's preventing uh, more events that are quite costly to the patient and to the healthcare system. How do the patients, do you get a sense from the paper how the patients feel? Because you, if you've got young steroids, you know, I think the physician doesn't play how well they feel, but this is low doses. Yeah. Um, from what I saw, it was pretty stable amongst the groups, and even better in the combination group. So, Martin, what do you think in terms of the quality? Yeah, that or disease. Um, so uh, Kim Chi obviously and he was part of the latitude investigators that uh, they published the stampede trial and latitude on the same day in the New England Journal um, this was a similar trial looking at abiraterone, prednisone, and metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer, um, but they were looking at uh, poor prognosis uh, metastatic prostate cancer um, instead of, you know, the locally advanced or nodal positive. So this was double-blind placebo-controlled, uh, where one of the arms had ADT, abiraterone, prednisone, uh, the other arm had ADT and two placebos, uh, so a bit different than, than the stampede. And they enrolled 1,199 patients uh, with metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer. And a lot of sites, 235 sites, 34 countries, uh, Canada included. So the patients, uh, at least 18 years, ECOG 0 to 2, uh, newly diagnosed, the same, same sort of criteria there that, that you have to be early in your um, process uh, for metastatic prostate cancer, pathologically confirmed, and no neuroendocrine or small cell histological features. And this is what I was getting at, at least two of, th two of three high risk factors associated with poor prognosis. Uh, so Gleason score of eight or more at least three bone lesions, and presence of measurable uh, visceral mets. And they excluded uh, those patients that had previous chemo, uh, radiation, or surgery for metastatic prostate cancer. So their endpoints uh, were similar, uh, similar sorry, uh, overall survival, but uh, they looked at radiographic progression-free survival as part of the uh, using the RESIST version 1.1. Their secondary endpoints were time to symptomatic skeletal event, PSA progression, 
uh, next therapy for prostate cancer, initiation of chemo, and pain progression. So 597 were in the abiraterone uh, group, 602 were in the placebo, uh, fall up a bit shorter, 34.4 months, and median time of intervention uh, was 24 months in the abiraterone group and 14 months in the placebo group. And in January uh, 12th of this year, uh, the trial is unblinded to allow crossover. So again, uh, we see a similar response to the combination of abiraterone, prednisone, and ADT versus ADT alone, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. Uh, radiographic progression-free survival was also significantly different, 33 months in the abiraterone group versus 14.8 in the placebo. And us as urologists, you know, this hit home for me that PSA progressed in the placebo group in 7.4 months, but took 33.2 months in the abiraterone. So, pretty significant. Adverse events were similar, uh, sort of hypertension, hypokalemia, ALT, AST but for the most part, uh, similar amongst the groups. There's an interesting uh, figure in the uh, supplemental appendix that those patients in Eastern Europe uh, did quite a lot better uh, than the placebo arm. And it's possible that they are more heavily dependent on abiraterone, the study drug, and that you know once they progressed, uh, after, you know, X amount of time, maybe weren't uh, offered uh, standard life-prolonging therapies after that. Uh, but they benefit greatly, and the hazard ratio is 0 0.50. And the placebo arm in this uh, region survived, on average, six and a half months less than uh, patients in Western Europe. I'm not, I'm not sure, sorry. Small. Um, so if you know that the placebo arm progressed at 7.4 months or had median radiographic uh, progression-free survival at 14 eight-point months, half of uh, the patients in the placebo arm received life-prolonged therapy at at 21 months. Um, so there seemed to have been a delay in uh, alternate therapies versus um, Stampede, where we said that after three months, 80% of patients were already on to the next uh, therapy. So there's a bit of a difference here, um, but still, abiraterone is superior in prolonging time to subsequent uh, prostate cancer therapy. And the most common uh, medication they were they received in this, uh, you know, first uh, therapy was uh, docetaxel. So again, you know, more effective inhibition of AR signaling early in patients with metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer leads to improved overall survival. So the question is, is you know, this structure on the left uh, better than this structure on the right? Or, you know, stampede latitude, is it better than, uh, you know, charted? So, taking you back to charted, that was docetaxel up front with ADT versus ADT alone. Uh, had a hazard ratio of 0 0.61 and a large overall survival benefit. So, it's strikingly similar in the metastatic arms of each. Uh, trial that there was a huge benefit. Uh, so I emailed Dr. Eigel and said, you know, where are we at now uh, with stampede and latitude? How will this affect practice locally? Um, at the agency, they'd love to use abiraterone or in the, you know, 
I guess, the province as well. Um, but they have no funding to do so. It's approved for CRPC. And uh, in his opinion, with the, the, um, the patent running out for Abiraterone, uh, you know, I've read various reports, but in the next year or two, generic forms of this drug can come out. Um, they're not going through the approval process for this uh, indication. So he said, you know, we're in a tough place because patients with high volume metastatic disease, as per charted, are still getting docetaxel, even though it's more toxic. And I asked him, you know, if costs were not an issue, he said likely most people would be getting abiraterone prednisone. Exactly. No, that's why I said, you know. Um, because <laughs> they get referrals from us with, I said, you know, what would a 65-year-old male with uh, large burden metastatic disease receive? With James on both sides, which also charted. Yeah. Um, so you know so the obvious, the, the obvious question is um, the combination: uh, Abby, docetaxel, uh, prednisone, ADT, all up front, and they're enrolling patients in those trials. The Piece one trial I uh, saw, uh, but um, that'll be coming out next one to two. <laughs> So I've learned this in residency, but anyways, moving on. Uh, okay. All right, so um, I was uh, speaking with Dr. Black, and he said that this, uh, in the last month, was came out at ESMO in uh, Madrid. And uh, these are the slides from that presentation, but I thought it was important that uh, this is potentially uh, changing um, the way we treat advanced or metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma. And one of the investigators is uh, Christian Colmansberg, who's obviously locally. Uh, so they looked at nivolumab and uh, ipilimumab, I had to practice that one a few times, uh, versus sinitinib uh, for treatment naive advanced or metastatic renal cell carcinoma. 
Uh, so we know that sinitinib and pazopinib are currently first line for advanced renal cell in Canada. Uh, nivolumab was shown efficacious and approved uh, for previously treated advanced RCC. And used in metastatic melanoma, this combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 antibody, uh, was efficacious. And not each agent, like the combination uh, was better versus each agent alone. So to review nivolumab, uh, it's a fully human IgG4 PD-1 antibody uh, that selectively blocks this interaction between the tumor cell and dendritic cell with PD-L1, PD-1, and PD-1 on the T cell. And inhibiting that process uh, leaves the T cell to be uh, activated and destroyed or be more, you know, enhance this response. In theory, this then creates less tumor evasion and greater immune response. And what is ipilimumab? It's also a monoclonal antibody that binds CTLA-4, a protein receptor that downregulates the immune system, uh, therefore leading to persistent T-cell activation and a hence immune response. Uh, so they've shown previously in earlier phase uh, trials that this combination is effective and safe uh, in uh, previously treated and treatment-naive patients with RCC. And they report the first results of their uh, trial. So this is their study design, basically one-to-one uh, -one randomization. And they stratified by IMDC prognostic score. And this is a prognostic score that um, involves anemia, thrombocytosis, neutrophilia, uh, KPS score of less than 80, uh, less than one year from diagnosis to uh, first line targeted therapy, and hypercalcemia. And those people with worse prognostic scores. Um, have been shown in previous studies, and this is validated, that they do, do much worse. So these patients are most uh, at need. Uh, so in the treatment arm, you get nivolumab um, every two weeks until you progress or toxicity, but only four doses of the ipilimumab uh, versus the standard of care, uh, sinitinib, orally once daily for four weeks. So their primary endpoint was looking to just the intermediate and poor risk patients, as well as an intention to treat arm, which had the favorable risk. Uh, but we know those patients do really well in sitting in there. Uh, but uh, so they looked at overall response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. And that's what I was getting at with this intention to treat patient. They involve the uh, favorable risk group. So the baseline characteristics were not different uh, in any of the uh, patient population. So for the IMDC intermediate poor risk, um, they had an overall response rate of 42% uh, versus 27%. And median duration of response was not reached for the nivoipi arm versus sinitinib, which was 18.2 months. So they were quite excited about this. Progression-free survival uh, had an advantage, 11.6 versus 8.4 months. And uh, overall survival, uh, the median overall survival hadn't been reached yet, but also significant with a hazard ratio of 0.63. And then when you in, do the intention to treat arm with the favorable risk, it was still significant. Uh, 39 versus 32 months uh, overall response rate. Sorry, percent. But when you look at the favorable risk, uh, sinitinib uh, was, was better. 
52% of them uh, responded, and their progression-free survival was was greater uh, than the than the nouveau ipi arm. So anti-tumor activity, we've seen this uh, by PDL1 expression in bladder cancer. Um, there are more complete responses if you if the tumor stain uh, for greater PDL1 expression. And they did better as well. Uh, the IMDC intermediate poor risk that had greater PDL1 of more than 1% um, did much better than the synodinib arm. The uh, adverse events were manageable and not any different than previous studies with these checkpoint inhibitors, where you get a different side effect profile. Uh, you get paritis, diarrhea, fatigue, um, and the adverse events in sinitinib arm uh, were the you know, uh, hand and foot uh, syndrome, uh, mucosal inflammation, stomatitis, change in taste. So nothing different here. And those are those immune-mediated uh, adverse events seen in the nivo ipi arm. And they're sort of new, odd uh, side effects. You know, it can cause basically itis of any uh, organ. And um, they just, you just need a high index of suspicion to uh, diagnose these. So they concluded that um, statistically significant overall survival benefit uh, with nivo ipi versus sinitinib and uh, improved overall response rate and median progression free survival greater than three months. And there's still a benefit in the intention to treat patients. And those that had greater PDL1 expression had a higher overall response rate and improved progression free survival. But those with FAVO risk had a higher response rate with sinitinib versus nivo uh, So they conclude that this should support the use of. Uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab as a new first-line standard therapy, uh, primarily with patients in the intermediate or poor risk. It's a lot of investigators. Uh, so how will Checkmate change practice? Uh, so there's this expectation that pending approval and, and um, you know, by the various FDA or uh, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, um, that this will be approved for intermediate poor risk uh, disease. Uh, looks like, you know, pending mature results, but synonym is better in the favorable risk category. And for now, unfortunately, synonym and pizopinib will remain standard of care until this approval or clinical trials. Um, so this was a abstract submitted by Dr. Messing, uh, AUA, uh, this year, and it looked at uh, gemcitabine uh, post-TRBT installation versus saline in non-muscle uh, urothelial carcinoma. So as you know, gemcitabine, uh, it's an anti-cancer nucleoside, inhib inhibition of DNA synthesis, uh, and it's an effective systemic agent, but has not been well studied for intravesical uh, therapy. We know that intravesical chemo after TRBT has shown reduced risk uh, by 35% versus TR alone, and is generally most beneficial for low risk disease. <laughs> so they recruited patients with suspected low grade non muscle invasive uh, UC based on cystoscopic appearance. And those patients were randomized to uh, TRBT and gemcitabine, or TRBT and uh, saline alone, held for one hour. And they excluded patients with a history of muscle invasive disease, upper tract disease, or prostate uh, urethral, you see. 
and those that were frequently recurrent uh, were also excluded. They were followed quarterly with cystoses for two years, then semi-annually, and their primary endpoint was timed recurrence. Uh, so they recruited around 400 patients, median age was 66 years, and 37% had recurrent disease, so disease in the past, and 68% of them only had one lesion. So in their primary intention to treat analysis, there was a significant 34% reduction in risk of recurrence in the gemcitabine arm compared to saline. Uh, one of the criticisms is that there was, you know, no comparative arm with standard of care, but it's just what they, they did. Uh, for the per protocol target population, uh, low grade non muscle invasive UC, uh, timed recurrence even more strongly favored gemcitabine. And it was quite well tolerated. Uh, and very few muscle invasive events. So there were no grade four or five complications, no difference in grade threes, and quite low in both arms. And no reported bladder wall dystrophic calcifications on follow-up cystoscopy, which is often uh, a negative or seen with mitomycin C. So they proved that it was safe, uh, well tolerated, and reduced recurrence. So how has it affected practice locally? Um, gemcitabine appears to be as effective and uh, has favorable side effect profile. Apparently the cost is much, much cheaper than mitomycin C. Um, so Dr. Black is starting to try to use it. Starting ordering it. 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Because it would be a hard trial to do standard. Small proportion of US. What do they do? Do they do? There's no indication. Yeah. Yeah, so I've crossed out my mice now. It needs it needs to go through proper channels, but the the paper has to go they will eventually. Moving on. Um, so highlights and stones. Uh, Dr. Chu, in the EDGE Consortium, uh, <coughs> performed a trial dusting versus basketing uh, for intrarenal stones during ureteroscopy. Uh, so there's, you know, two options when you're 
form a ureteroscopy for intrarenal stones? Uh, do you bask it or, or dust? Uh, there are advantages of both, but no prospective trials looking at this and comparing these techniques. So they enrolled patients 18 to 80 years. Uh, stones at or above the UPJ from 5 to 20 millimeters. And surgeons were either basketers or dusters, so they only offered their preferred uh, technique. Access sheath is used for all basketing cases and up to the surgeon discretion for dusting cases. All patients received a ureteral stent for 4 to 14 days, and uh, post operative alpha blocker is given for 30 days. Follow up was with KUB x ray and renal ultrasound 4 to 6 weeks. <coughs> They looked at stone free rates at six weeks post-op. <clears throat> Fragments of any size, so that's one, two, any size, on either KUB or renal ultrasound. So what were the results? Uh, they enrolled 75 patients in the dusting arm and 84 in the basketing. The stones in the uh, dusting uh, patient population were larger. Uh, versus the basketing population. And they had, you know, if you can't interpret the surface area, the, the maxim, maximum diameter on the axial view was 8.8 .8 versus 11.3, so about 2 millimeters larger. And no difference in pre stented patients. So stone free rates, uh, the basking cohort did, did much better than the uh, dusting cohort, 74 versus 58% stone free rate, and that's with no fragments seen. Um, what fragments were seen in follow-up mostly just had one, um, but some patients had obviously more than one. There's a nice table of looking at stone free rates by size, and it didn't really impact the, the stone free rate. You know, my initial impression was that all oh, the dusters, you know, had larger stones, uh, but at each uh, size breakdown, uh, the stone free rate was, was almost the same. Uh, it probably just took longer in the basking arm. And as well as, you know, by the medians, uh, same. This is interesting. So, uh, you know, the basketers spent almost twice as long uh, treating the stone than the dusting cohort. But at the end of, of the case, you know, when, when you confirm visual clearance of the stone or radiographic, um, there's almost a 20% drop six weeks post-op uh, in stone-free rate. So you think you got it all, and then uh, later, you know, there's small fragments. And in the dusting cohort, you know, visual clearance, obviously there's <coughs> dust flying around, but uh, radiographic, uh, you know, 82% of these uh, cases were, were, were clear, and, and the thought is that, that oh, these, these fragments will pass or pass on their own. The complications in return hospital were no different in each of the groups. Uh, some patients after uh, stent removal uh, needed a, another stent. So there's pros in the basketing, 74.7% uh, stone free rate uh, was significantly higher than the dusting arm, uh, but the, the dusting cohort uh, were in the OR 44% less of the time. And this may reduce cost uh, by not requiring a basket or access sheath. And I found it interesting that that breakdown that the stone free rates were independent of stone size and more consistent <coughs> with the technique. So, you know, they recruited surgeons that were either dusters or basketers. And it's funny like how you'd become entrenched in one or the other, uh, given that at the end of the case, the basketer thinks they've got it all, whereas the duster, you know, relies on you know, uh, you know, passive, uh, you know, clearance of the stones. <clears throat>
So what can we learn? Um, you know, there's obviously an advantage of dusting. You're more efficient in the OR, spending half the time. But they didn't do as well in the stone free rate. So maybe a combination of both dusting the stone when it's large and basking the small fragments out to, to boost your uh, stone free rates would be the best technique. And this reaches maximum efficiency, lowest cost, and least risk of reintervention. Uh, so, a couple more minutes here. So, pediatrics, uh, they validated the uh, twist score in uh, a non medical, uh, sorry, non physician um, provider of, of healthcare. So uh, testicular torsion is a urological emergency, and you need prompt and accurate diagnosis, obviously. And they developed this twist score where you assign 0 to 7 points, uh, 2 for testicular swelling, 2 for hard testicle, 1 for absent cremasteric reflex, 1 for nausea vomiting, and 1 for high-riding testicle. And this was NIH-funded. Uh, males one month, 21 years, presenting with an acute scrotum. And they valet this in a non-urological, non-physician provider. They used an emergency medical technician, uh, which uh, screened all patients immediately for inclusion and exclusion criteria. And they had no special additional training. They calculated a twist score and determined Tanner stage and all patients received a scrotal ultrasound. Uh, so those uh, patients with torsion were older, uh, and uh, I found it interesting that, that their median hours of pain before arrival was, was quite long, 17.3 uh, versus 29 hours. Those with a twist score of zero, um, did not have torsion, and those with a twist score of seven uh, always had torsion. And then area under ROC curve uh, shows that it's a, a good test for the score itself and by risk category. And it was also excellent uh, by Tanner stage as well. So they determined this algorithm uh, where a patient comes in, low risk twist score, uh, no ultrasound necessary, high risk, advanced Tanner stage, uh, you go right to the OR because those people have torsion. So it's highly predictive uh, in a, in, by EMTs. Uh, the previous studies were by urologists. Uh, and that um, they recommend ultrasounds in, in, in those patients that are are, are younger, uh, and it av avoided 50% uh, of ultrasounds in these patients. So BC Children's has employed a similar algorithm where they're using the uh, twist score. And um, when when I asked Dr. McNeely about you know the challenges, you know, uh, radiology is reluctant to increase their availability and service. Uh, ER docs are afraid to make a call on the actual score. Um, and they're used to being denied access to imaging. So the premise here is that they can get the ultrasound before having being examined by a urologist. Positives are that it, it objectifies the assessment, good for resident learning, encourages uh, radiology to come in, and uh, avoids <laughs> unnecessary explorations. Was that? US, NIH. Was that one of the issues? So 
Is that correct? For 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 the milk pack, but also like the temperature is a milk pack. It's a milk pack decision. Yeah, not we don't have get done. Steam engine. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 well, I mean, the ideal case of physiology, senior football player, football college, seven. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to work. Yeah. You know, when they open the ER, the patient is in there. Yeah. 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 Oh, they love it. And when, when, you, when they call you, they say, well, I said, I have some patients who can open. It's out. It's wrong. Why? Why you're not? Mm -hmm. Like they do weird bodies. It, 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 it's so like, you know, like it's, you know, it's, I feel personally it's it's graphic. It's very So last uh, paper, just a couple minutes, and then uh, most of the discussion was sort of within the rounds, which is great, uh, but we're sort of running out of time. Uh, so this looked at trying to decrease delayed graph function uh, in cadaveric uh, donors. Um, and they looked at therapeutic hypothermia. Uh, so, you know, when people have massive strokes or, uh, you know, they cool the brain and this is shown to be beneficial. So they looked at uh, whether or not this mild hypothermia would, would uh, benefit uh, the kidneys with respect to delayed graft function. Uh, so it was California, Nevada, two large donation service areas, and they randomized the donors with brain death to mild hypothermia versus normal thermia. And they, their outcome was delayed graft function, uh, which is the requirement for dialysis in the first uh, seven days. Uh, there was no difference in the populations. Uh, the creatinines were equivalent. And when they looked at delayed graft function, those that uh, had hypothermia donors uh, did a lot better, uh, had less DGF, 28.2% versus 39%. And this study was stopped early because there was a large benefit. So odds ratio of 0 0.62, hypothermia versus normal thermia. And obviously, those patients with the higher creatinine, uh, when they donated, uh, had more DGF. Not surprising. Uh, so mild hypothermia in organ donors um, was beneficial uh, for DG, decreasing DGF. So a summary slide, running out of time, uh, but we've got new standards of care in uh, metastatic prostate cancer and metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, a less toxic, cheaper option for post-TRBT chemo. Uh, it looks like we have to be basketing more intrarenal stones to get higher stone free rates. Twist score is an excellent tool for torsion, and perhaps cooling our donors would um, create less DGF. So thanks for all the staff that helped with this rounds, and uh, we only have a few minutes left.